Tribe. I am so excited that we're catching up with Shona McPherson. We last spoke with Shona at the beginning of July in 2019, where she shared more about taking on new challenges at 40 and her preparation for through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, Sobo, so southbound, heading from Canada down to Mexico. Shona is now back in um, back in Scotland. Shona, how are you doing? Massive congratulations on completing the Pacific Crest Trail. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, how are you feeling being back? Um, yeah, really happy to be home. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see people again and to, to be back in the Highlands. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like it's, you know, obviously we're going to be talking about your whole experience, the highs, the lows, the ups and the downs. But for people who maybe haven't listened to the first episode, would you just like to just give everyone a little bit more background about who you are, what you do, where you're based, all of that good stuff? I am based in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland and I work here as a life coach and as a counsellor and I also do treks for wellbeing working with a mountain guide um, just for women in the Cairn Gorms um, near where I, where I live. Let's talk about the Pacific Crest Trail. So you, you headed over. Um, when did you start? What was it like in like, you know, sort of flying over to America and suddenly it's like, you know, when it, when your dream started to become a massive reality? It was strange and surreal, I suppose, after quite a lot of planning to actually be flying out to Seattle. And I stayed with a friend of a friend for a few days in Seattle. And it was really nice to be met by somebody who I didn't know, but kind of I felt like I knew. She was very kind. She helped me sort out my food resupply boxes and we together posted some on and um, then she was going to send more on to me later on the trail. So it was nerve wracking, but kind of maybe becoming more real at that stage. And then from there, I had a few days there. I think I maybe had three days, maybe in Seattle, doing last minute things like that. And then I got a train to a place called Bellingham. And I stayed with a volunteer, lovely man um, who was a trail angel there, just got there late one night. And the next morning he took me and one, two, three other women uh, that were also staying there to the trailhead uh, and that was then where it all kind of began um, and that was on the 4th of July so yeah I left on the 1st of July flew out and then sort of got to the start of the trail on the afternoon of the 4th of July. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Did you have a lot to do in those three days? What, was that quite sort of overwhelming because you were doing sort of resupply boxes and everything else like how easy was that do, to do once you were on the ground over there? Yeah, I think just because I was staying with this lovely lady who dedicated her time to driving me around, um, it was fairly easy. Um, we went to, I think it was Walmart and um, just I kind of had a list, a bit of a plan of what I was already going to get and a plan of um, what towns I was sending food to and all the addresses. And I had already sent the sort of arranged for the boxes to be in her house so it wasn't easy but it wasn't terrible either um uh, but yeah it definitely took the time that I'd set aside I didn't have much time to play with and the American postal system was a little bit complicated there was some you would send by one some delivery company and some by the other depending on where you were sending it to so without her help I think I'd have found that a lot more difficult um but because of her help it was it was pretty smooth sailing I guess yeah do you remember back to the first day to the 4th of July like I mean mm. were there fireworks going off in the evening when, <laughs> for the first night of camping uh, if there were I didn't hear them <laughs> uh yes yeah, so we we started myself and then these other three lovely ladies um started it's a bit strange if you're southbounding the PCT you don't actually start at the monument you've you um, have to walk from a, a trailhead 30 miles north to the start. Um, so I only got half there. I didn't even get to the monument on the first day. I just did um, 15 miles, I think it was, in the first day. I didn't think we, don't think we started till sort of half past two in the afternoon or something. Um, so it was, I remember it was cold. I thought I was going to wear shorts and I had to change into my leggings. And I remember just walking and feeling a bit trippy, like, oh, this is this is it. I am actually starting and not quite feeling like I was really there. And also being quite focused on wanting to make 15 miles in the first day, which is pretty silly, really. <laughs> uh, and I remember 
I, I was mostly working working with this other lovely lady called Yatsi. And then we made the 15 miles and camped it in this beautiful meadow. And it was cold. I remember eating eating my dinner and then just getting straight into my tent. And um, yeah, no fireworks, <laughs> but a lot of people, unfortunately. That was um, not what I'd expected. It was really, really busy. And the main reason for that was I was southbounding and not that many people do it still, although there were significantly more, I think, than previous years. But most people start at the Mexican border and go northbound. But they had a really difficult year for northbounding. So um, they'd started in the spring, but there had been really bad snow. So a lot of people got as far as the Sierra Mountains and then decided to do what's called a flip. So they got transport then up to where I was. And um, they were also um, then going south so they had quite complicated routes but for that reason there were a lot of us on trail either let me going north to the monument or they'd tag the monument they were coming back so we were passing each other on trail so it was really busy which I did not expect yeah what was it like seeing the monument like because that must have been mm. like just momentous like the, the, I, mean, I know it's, I know it's momentous finishing it but also seeing the start like it's the it's the actual start of this this dream that you've had for a long time and you've put a huge amount of time and effort into the planning and preparation to get to that point and then you're there you're, you're touching it like I mean yeah yeah it was cool <laughs> it was literally cool was, remember it was raining and really cold <laughs> and it took t- two days to get there so it was funny like I had started but I hadn't started, if that makes sense, because actually tagging the monument was the beginning of the 2,650 miles of the actual trail. Um, but I guess it was a relief to think, OK, actually, I am now at the start. I've done all I, all the stuff I can do. Now I've just got to go all the way south for a long time. And, <laughs> and also it was nice because it was in a really remote area. There was nothing there apart from the monument. And there was sort of a strip of ground that was sort of reasonably well kept and then on either side it was really overgrown so it was just really simple whereas as I'll get to later when I got to the the Mexican border it was a very different situation a big wall being near it <laughs> um, but yeah we'll probably get to that later. Yeah. So tell us about the first the first sort of days the first sort of week like how how easy was it getting into getting into your routines or you know sleeping out there in, in the wilderness you know what what was that like I think I was a bit um twitchy at the start <laughs> um if I can if I can remember back it, it sort of yeah I, it feels like I was quite nervous I was really trying to make miles quite quickly I think within a couple of days I was going for 20 mile days and I was really focused on on that and being worried that I was going to not be fast enough I remember that being part partly there for me and I remember it being really wet and cold and be, that being a big worry for me as well um um but also like you said within the range of a week I'd say that would probably be in the first three or four days but by the time I'd tagged the border and had walked back um to Hearts Pass where I'd started and kept going, it began to then just get more of a sense of spaciousness and a, more of a belief that, oh, yeah, here I am. This is going to become my new normal. I don't think sleeping was ever a big problem. <laughs> I think it's um, at that stage anyway, I, I slept well. And I just then began, I guess, to get to find more of a groove and a, a, groove and a rhythm and um, a way of just like knowing where things are in my pack and sort of managing that better and finding a routine but I think it probably did take about a week just to begin to get that groove you you talked about sort of pushing 20 mile days pretty quickly um Mm -hmm. where was that pressure coming from was that was that like yeah sorry I'll let you answer the question (laughs) oh yeah sure um yeah so that was coming from my within me um and my absorption of things that I had read that said if you were southbounding the PCT, there is more of a time pressure to get get your miles quickly so that you're not hitting the the High Sierra, the John Muir Trail when the snows start. So there's a kind of a, a notional guideline. I, I can't quite get the date in my head, but the worst memory. But I think it's something like the 
um, the 16th of October, you should be through the high Sierra. It's some, something sort of date like that. So I had in my head, right, okay, I need to quite quickly get to be doing 20 mile-ish days and to be able to sustain that. Um, and I just wasn't quite sure what I was capable of. So there was that sort of nervousness of, right, come on, don't be messing around. Uh, don't get sort of sucked into going into towns too much and things like that. Um I and mean, then later on, I realised I, I was fit enough and I could have trusted myself sooner. But I think at the first, I just I wasn't quite sure what I was capable of because I'd never done anything like that before. So pressure I was putting on myself. When did you yeah. start realising, like, how capable that you were? Like, when did you start sort of, sort of thinking, hold on, I'm doing this. I'm mm-hmm. walking these big miles, these big distances and carrying everything that you need on your back? To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember a day where I kind of, went from one to the other it was much more of a gradual thing um so I, I genuinely don't know um but I suppose uh, so the first 500 miles ish is Washington state uh, and I so maybe it took me all of Washington I remember kind of being in Oregon with with sitting with a friend in the Timberline Lodge which is a really lovely place that you get your resupply in Oregon and we met a bunch of people and we were saying oh yeah we're doing this and they were like that's amazing and we were kind of like yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> so I think before I would go, oh, well, maybe it's amazing, but I don't know if I can do it. But I remember kind of maybe accepting their appreciation of what we were doing. Um, that's the only kind of mark I can maybe get. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What were you thinking about during the days? Did you have like um, like a routine? So for example, on the Appalachian Trail, I wouldn't listen to anything until after 12 o'clock and then I might move on to like podcasts or music or audio books, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of what was going on mentally, did Mm-hmm. Was it a time for you to do that, to do re- reflection or is it a time for you to, to catch up? You know, what what was happening mentally? Uh, like you, I had a bit of a, I set myself some rules <laughs> so that I didn't just listen to music or podcasts all day. Um, and then, but so, so uh, yeah, I probably had about, I think something similar, like after midday, I, I could kind of let, let myself do what I want. And then I would just be organic on that. So some days I didn't listen to anything. Uh, and other days I would have an audiobook or a podcast from maybe two o'clock or, or so to just have some different stimulation. Because I didn't want to just also be ruminating. Like if I noticed my th- thoughts were maybe turning more negative um, and I wouldn't have any new thoughts to come in, uh, then I would maybe put something on. Or if I just thought I'm just... I'm not interested in my own internal dialogue anymore and would put something on. I was generally walking alone. I made lots of friends and would maybe, you know, walk with somebody for an hour or two here or there. But mostly I was on my own and that was intentional because I did want to have sort of see how I am being alone with myself for that much time. Um, but some of the time, especially in the morning, I was trying to just be present to notice the nature so not even necessarily think anything um which is very difficult <laughs> and then the thoughts would come and then I would observe them and um yeah so there's just there was quite a few different things going on um going on mentally but yeah some time alone some mindfulness some working out things dreaming about the future thinking about things in the past um and then getting some new stimulation learning through books and podcasts or just having some enjoyable music or entertainment. Yeah. There was some definite I remember I've you know, I was it was fantastic to follow along on your on your Instagram with your posts and and to read, you know, you have a beautiful way with words and an incredible way of communicating sort of, you know, what what's going on and you definitely face some challenges while you while you were out there. I think um would you like to share a little bit more about a couple of those challenging moments? Yes, absolutely. But actually, Sarah, you've just reminded me of another answer to your first, your initial, your original question there. Um, when you were saying what was on, going on mentally, one of the things I really was intentional about doing was documenting my journey through keeping a diary. And while I was walking, I was actually experiencing whatever was coming up for me, but then thinking about what that was and how I would share that when I wrote in the evenings and um, so that was another practice that I found really useful and, and helpful so in answer to your question there the the difficult things I experienced um, I had two difficult health episodes one was a I developed what I later discovered was severe iron deficiency anemia but looking back I probably walked for a very long time with with the, with anemia and it got progressively worse until to the extent where I was finding it 
really difficult to breathe and I was walking at one mile an hour <laughs> before I got diagnosed and I was in the beginning of the high Sierra, just sort of the mountain area just leading up to that when I realised I had to get treatment and um, yeah, so things got had got really difficult. I just wasn't moving fast enough. I was getting really breathless. I was feeling nauseous and I was beginning to just feel pretty low in mood because of all of that. And I just couldn't work out why. I had begun to suspect possible anemia. So I, I'm vegetarian. I had started eating meat, but I really struggled with eating anything, to be honest, at that stage as well. So I hitchhiked from a place called Tuami Meadows, which is near Yosemite, into Mammoth Mammoth Lakes, which is a really nice city to be unwell in, <laughs> or a nice town to be unwell in. And I uh, went to accident and uh, went to the emergency room and uh, saw a doctor there and was um, they tested my haemoglobin and they said I had half of the haemoglobin of a normal person and how the hell had I been walking for so long? And it actually felt a real relief to know there was actually something specific wrong with me rather than these very vague general symptoms that I'd been having. But what was very difficult there was the doctor didn't think it was nutritional, the, my anemia. Um, she said my red blood cells were presenting in a way that wasn't representative of nutritional anemia. So she thought there was something more sinister going on. And she re- advised me to she gave me a blood transfusion, but then advised me to fly back to Scotland and to see a specialist to work out why my um, iron levels were so low. So that was devastating. And I was looking into flights, but at the same time, I was messaging a friend of mine who works at the London School of Tropical Medicine and is anemia specialist. And I'm so fortunate to have Phil as my friend. And he questioned her um, opinion and wrote a letter for my insurers to say why he questioned it and long story short my insurance health insurance travel insurance agreed for me to have a second opinion and told me how to get a second opinion because I didn't know how to do that in America and the second opinion the blood test revealed that I did have nutritional anemia and it would be rectified by already I'd had the blood transfusion by also taking iron supplements and that I could get back on the trail in three days so that was amazing yeah that must have been an emotional roller coaster. I mean, I, I I remember like getting quite tearful and quite emotional when I saw like the photo of Instagram of you in, in hospital and then like hearing about the anemia and I was like, oh my God, because yeah, ups and downs and um, like, yeah. especially when, when you thought that you, you know, your trip was going to be over. Mm. What What was that like? I mean... Yeah, it was, I think I, I, I was really quite exhausted with having kind of walked being unwell for so long. And um, I think I was so relieved to know that, that, that I had anemia. So, okay, right, this is a thing. You're not going crazy. You're it's not, not really yeah, unfit. Yeah, it's not in your head. It's not in your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's not in your head. And then I felt really emotional and sad, but I felt this wave of acceptance that this is what it is. And you were lucky enough to be able to fly back to a country where you can have an expert help you work out what's wrong and hopefully find a, a situation. So I, I grieved. This is all within the course of sort of 24 hours. I, I grieved the trail, but accepted it because I do, one of the things that I do in my work and in my personal life is try not to argue with reality or not for long. <laughs> so I felt, I felt sad, but also like it was all going to be okay and the trail isn't the be all and end all the walk for me was never just about getting from the start to the finish I always knew it was going to be about learning about myself and how I deal with difficulty and then actually when my friend Phil uh, messaged and challenged the diagnosis I had a little bit of um, resistance I was like oh don't like didn't believe that that things could quickly turn around (laughs) and like oh, like this is just going to get more complicated and, and it's still not going to work out. So I had a little bit of resistance to to him saying, oh, actually, I disagree. Because I didn't, I just didn't know what to do with that information. Um, and I didn't know how to challenge a doctor's opinion in America. And it all just felt exhausting. And, um, and I was also at this point really worried about how much my insurance would or wouldn't cover. So there was some financial worries there. Um, so I just turned it back on him. <laughs> like my friend, is, he's, a, he's a saint. I just said, OK, if this is the case. Can you write me a professional letter explaining all of this? Um, and then sent that to me and seeing all of your qualifications that make you <laughs> able to and can you put it on a London school letterhead or whatever and then to my insurers I said if, if you when they said we'll back you I said well can you tell me exactly what to do because I don't know how to deal with this in America and all of that 
Um, so it was overwhelming, I suppose, and a bit of an emotional roller coaster. But I suppose, like my, I suppose my the things that got me through it were being able to accept reality and not argue with it, and being able to ask for help, asking Phil for help, asking my insurance for help, and um, and the help came, <laughs> and just realizing you don't, you never have to do everything on your own. Or I'm lucky that I never feel like I never have to do everything on my own and I don't have to be this strong person that can work everything out because often I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what was the second biggest challenge that you faced? So then about a month later, I um, had finished, had I? Yes, I'd finished going through the high Sierras, which were amazing and that might come up later. Um, but then I just started getting this horrendous nausea. It had come and gone in waves before, but it became stronger and stronger and again I didn't know what was wrong couldn't work it out hoped it would pass and then it, it, it just got worse and worse and I took some days off the trail and I began to feel a little bit better got back on trail walked for 10 miles and I developed this horrendous diarrhea and um yeah messaged a doctor friend and um through going back and forth with her decided to get off trail again which felt absolutely devastating because <laughs> um, I was just aware time was passing and was getting behind and um, went to a town I went to an urgent care clinic and basically my doctor friend in Scotland said she thought it was Giardia and I told the doctor urgent care this and the, it's quite hard to diagnose and it takes a while to get the tests back so the doctor just asked me a bunch of questions and accepted my friend's advice <laughs> or, or, or idea that it probably was Giardia and um, wrote me up for the prescription for the antibiotics that I needed. It was, the doctor was amazing, really helpful, and discharged me that same day. So I, I just was an outpatient and got treated for Giardia and then stayed in a hotel in this town in Los Angeles for a few days, Pam, Pam's, Pamdale it was called. And um, it got worse briefly. Um, uh, yeah, so I was so glad to be in a hotel so I could just go to the bathroom <laughs> and vomited a lot and had lots of diarrhea. And then very then within one and a half days, felt amazing. <laughs> had an appetite back and um, then got back on trail after two days and just felt really normal again. Um, but I, I actually, although I was chronically unwell with the anemia, the giardia, when it was acute, I've never felt that unwell, I don't think, or not for a long time. Um, so that that was really horrible. But yeah, again, just so lucky to to have wise friends and to have uh, health insurance and to be able to get advice really quickly. And with hindsight, I should have got it looked at sooner. But because I just had the nausea and the, didn't have the diarrhea for quite a long time, I didn't realise it probably was Giardia. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Abby Lloyd from the Tough Girls Tribes um, got a question actually, which sort of fits in really nicely here. She, she said she you know loved following this adventure on Instagram. Um, I know that there are a few times when you almost had to stop the trail. But she wants to know, were there any times when you actually wanted to quit the trail? So I never, the, the only, the time that I most understood why people quit the trail and considered it was when I was really feeling unwell with Giardia and didn't at this point have antibiotics or a, 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 a diagnosis. So I didn't make the decision, I, I'm going to quit the trail, but I did consider it and and just thought I totally get why people do this, <laughs> why they come off trail and stop. Um, that was this, that was the closest I came to that. Yeah. So it never, it was never like I'm going to quit, uh, but it was like, yeah, this is not fun anymore, and there, I don't have to continue. It became a possibility, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. On the trail, um, people get trail names, and I'd love for you to share what your trail name was and how you got it, and uh, whether yeah. you liked it or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My trail name was my Sharona which comes from a song in the 70s, My, My, My Sharona. Apparently it's got a really good guitar solo, so if you don't know it, uh, check it out. And that, my trail name came from, I had just finished um, the sort of 500 miles of um, walking Washington State, and I was in, in at Cascade Locks, which is kind of, if you know the film Wild, that's where Cheryl Strayed finishes the um the PCT. Uh, so I was sitting in, the, in a bar there and a lovely friend of mine called De Jour, who's from the Isle of Skye, good representation from Scotland there. <laughs> we were sitting in this bar together uh, and with, with some other folks on the trail and 
lots it was quite a social place lots of people coming in and they were asking my name and american people really struggled or some of them really struggled to say shona so say what's your name say shona they go oh hey shona I say it's Shona, and they're like, "Yeah, that's what I just said." I was like, "No, it's." <laughs> <laughs> so my my Scottish friend Desiree found this hilarious, and he's like, "We have to get you a trail name." So he was just then riffing on the word Shona, and he was like, "Shona, Sh- uh, Sharona," and then somebody else was like, "Oh, my Sharona," or, and started singing my Sharona. And then, um, so I tried it out, tried it for size, because other people were coming in, they were like, what's your name? And it's like, oh, my Sharona. And then a few people started singing my name. And I thought, how cool to have a trail name that when people say hello to you, they actually start singing. So it stuck, and I really like it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. My Sharona. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that, you know, when you start the trail southbound, there's there's this, almost this this pressure to get to the Sierra Mountains and around you know the 16th of October. And Monica Aguilar says, "Congratulations, well done on the trail." But she, but she wants to know how were the Sierra Mountains? What was the reality versus the fear mongering? Sierras were beautiful. They were absolutely beautiful. Uh, a, a real highlight for me for the trail for sure. Um, and yes, was the fear mongering as I as I um, experienced it was just about getting through them in time before the snow hits. Um, didn't, didn't, I didn't feel any other fear mongering about them being dangerous in any other way. And the reality was, I was so lucky with the weather. Snow had hit me earlier, very briefly, but there were just sporadic, a couple of sporadic snow days. But while I was in the Sierra, there's a little bit of lying snow from the spring, but there was no new snow while I was there. Um, so it was it was really lush, heavy going in terms of um, you're climbing uh, up a pass, at least one pass a day and uh, coming down again. So like cardiovascularly, fitness wise, it was tough going. And they were cold because you were at high altitude. The cold was the one bit of the Sierras I did struggle with um I hate the cold although I'm from the highlands of Scotland I'm quite a softy and I've got really bad circulation so in the mornings I would wake up sometimes and my water bottle had frozen so centigrade wise it was about freezing zero or maybe slightly slightly lower um so I did suffer a little bit but worth it 100 percent worth it because it was just beautiful the views you got the sunsets the sunrise yeah just absolutely stunning yeah I know you said you sort of walked quite um, quite a bit of it sort of solo. But did you did you mm-hmm. end up sort of spend having a little bit of a trail family or bumping into mm-hmm. people um, who you'd maybe seen earlier on? Yeah, and- yeah, I did. I wouldn't say I had a trail family um, that that because that tends to be people would would sort of say where they're going to camp together and all of that. Um, but I I was caught because of my. It, sort of two major sickness episodes and having to come off the trail twice I people talk about a bubble so you're kind of within a bubble of people that are before you know you're kind of you're before them they're before you you bump into each other a lot I kind of switched quite a lot of bubbles because I was kind of moving around with with time um that way um so I actually got to know loads of people that because I wasn't just in one bubble the whole time but yeah, there was a couple of I've make, made a few close people I would consider close friends. Um, yeah, and maybe did have a few names to throw in there. Uh, my friend Cherise and my friend Yatsi, and I mentioned Dejour. I'm just randomly saying people's names that I remember <laughs> who were important to me. And then I made uh, a lot friends with a lovely couple. Um, Bill was from Texas, and Pisces was from Colombia, and they invited me to spend Thanksgiving with them in Texas, which I did. So they're just a few names of um, many wonderful, wonderful people that I met. Um, yeah, yeah. How were the river crossings for you? Were they were they quite? Did you did you have any serious river crossings, or or did that not really happen when you go when you go southbound? I was again really really lucky. That was one of my biggest fears. People are like, oh, what's your biggest fear? Is it bears? Is it this? Or is it that? And just from reading about the PCT, I was quite worried about rivers crossings. But just because, as a sober, we didn't have a heavy snow year, um, I got really lucky. Yeah. Um, I can't remember any that scared me, actually. No, um, there's quite a lot of bridges. Um, and when there's not bridges, I love a good river crossing. If there's stones to be jammed across, I'm on them. But again, I think North Boundaries had a hard time in the Sierras. But by the time I got there, most of the snow melt had, had sort of gone and there wasn't new heavy water. So, um, 
again, unless my memory has blanked something out, <laughs> I'm not remembering any scary river crossings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then, you know, my off things, 2,650 miles is a heck of a way to walk. Um, yeah. Tell us about the finish and, and coming to the final monument down, um, you're obviously still in America, but, you know, towards towards Mexico. Yeah, how how was it just reaching the monument? Yeah, just reaching yeah, it and getting there. And, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Um, that is a good question, and I find it hard to answer. I remember I had a, it was twenty miles from. I'd stayed with this beautiful couple in uh, just in their home uh, near was it Mount Laguna? I've forgotten where that <laughs> second last place was, and um, then it was it was twenty miles to the border. And I kind of was trying to have low expectations because I think often it's a bit of an anticlimax, isn't mm, it? When you yeah. come to, uh, sorry, it was late Morena, late, late Morena was the place that I stayed the night before. So I had such a beautiful evening with this lovely, lovely couple. And um, and then I had 20 miles to walk. And I knew my my, my friends that I mentioned earlier, Bill and Pisces, I knew they were going to be finishing roughly at the same time. But I was walking on my own and then I was going to meet them there. And it was weird. At the start of the day, I had this really high energy from enjoying my, the company of my, my friends that night and in the morning and then just being on my own. So I was super hyper for the first like five miles or maybe, yeah, 15 miles. And then I felt really quite flat and just, oh, I've still actually got like a good 10 miles to walk here. And yeah, like, oh, right. And then it was lovely. The lady that I had stayed with that night, she just then appeared. <laughs> and um, walked a few miles with me because you had to cross this motorway and she felt weird that I was sort of finishing on my own so she wanted to just cheer me on which was absolutely amazing and then I was sort of cheery again I guess and and less philosophical and um, the light was just as I, as I got there it was just a beautiful light um, coming towards a sort of a dusky light and it was actually just really nice because I'd lost I'd sort of worked through not having big expectations anyway, but I did find it sad that the 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 wall is there that's dividing Trump's wall that's dividing Mexico and America, and it's really close to the men- monument and it's got barbed wire on it, and um, that made me sad. I knew it was going to be there, but it just it just made me sad that the the trail for me had, um, represents so much human kindness like that was one of the things I'm taking away from the trail and that might come out more in more detail as we chat but just the kindness that I received from from Americans taking me into their homes hitch, giving me hitchhikes messages of support from friends and family in Britain and all over the world and then to just end it and to see this um this wall and but in, in some ways that sort of fuel to my fire of that's not the last word in the story by any means you know I'm not rem- going to remember that wall as the final thing I saw because there was much more kindness again after that but yeah it's just that the reality isn't it we live in a world of with both kindness and of, with um things that divide us um yeah and then my friends arrived uh, about an hour later somebody had left beer and cider so I had a cheeky cider to myself and then uh, the sun was setting and my friends came and uh, we celebrated and took photographs together. And then I spent that evening with my friends and with others camp- camped in Campo. And that was fun. That was it was a lovely evening. And then I went on this big road trip. So tinged, tinged with, with sadness, but also a really beautiful time you mentioned um a lot, a lot of names of people that you met out on the trail and you talked you know talked about people who who opened their homes to you and who, who gave you rides and one of our one of our patrons and supporters from New Zealand at Damiana Day she shared a post in the Tough Girl Tribe basically saying you know a big thank you to all the different trail angels out there and what are some people's stories of different trail angels that have helped them on their own journeys you know I'd love for you just maybe just to share a few of a few of those stories and moments I know that's difficult to do because the kindness of strangers on these long distance through hikes is just overwhelmingly oh god it's gonna give me emotional it's 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 absolutely incredible but you know yeah just 
a few a few of those magical moments yeah yeah two it was two that really stand out for me one is um, was in oregon in um, the Sis- sisters there's a town called sisters which is a beautiful name for town isn't it <laughs> and um i went i had really sore feet and i so i'd come off trail kind of as a last minute decision i came off trail to get new insoles and to get some new treatment for my blisters and I, the, the post office in Sisters was a mile from the, the main town. So I'd got a hitchhike off trail and the guy had dropped me all the way to the post office. He was a really kind man, prayed for me. <laughs> um, I hadn't asked him to, but it was very, very kind of him. Anyway, he prayed for my feet. And then I was in the post office and I was just packing up something. I can't quite remember what I was doing. And this lady um, just said, oh, hello, um, you look really tired. Uh, would you like me to drive you back to the town when you're finished? I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Um, so then um, she waited for me to do what I had to do in the post office. And then she um, drove me. And as she was driving me to town, she said, oh, where are you staying tonight? And I hadn't really, I didn't have a master plan, but I was roughly going to hitchhike kind of back out into the bush and camp before we're going on to the next place so I just said oh I'm going to hike and then camp up and she said oh do you know the weather's not looking good um I think you should come and stay with me and my husband <laughs> and we actually have a uh next to our stables she sort of lived in some kind of ranch she said next to our stables we've actually got a small sort of hut that you can stay in and I was like oh well, okay, that'd be amazing. Because she was, she didn't, she didn't seem crazy. She seemed lovely. So I thought, yeah, okay. And I had this most amazing evening um, sitting in, this was still sort of summertime. And so there was lots of daylight. And we were sitting in her patio and her and her husband. They would be in their early 70s. And uh, we sat and they, there was a hummingbird coming to the, the flowers. And we were drinking wine and sharing that music and travel and I just had a lovely evening and I stayed in this gorgeous little um, room that they had and the next morning uh, we went to a bakery and she took me in her uh, open top car <laughs> with the, the top down the music blaring back to the trailhead <laughs> it's just amazing I love she was called Sally and uh, we exchanged contact details so I really hope they come and visit me so that was amazing just really lifted my spirits and then the second story that really comes to mind was um, more recently I was in uh, where was I I'd finished the Sierra so I was in southern California and I was kind of on it I was on a mission I'd lost some time I just got better from the Giardia and I was like right come on stop going off trail doing things keep keep on the trail and uh, I decided I'd walked 20 miles and I to, to get to a town called Wrightwood and it's a bit of a hike so I was hitchhiking to get into Wrightwood and my plan was go for an hour get your food resupply charge your phone for an hour in the store that you can do that and then get back on trail and sleep on trail so you can get a long day the next day so so I was hi- waiting to get a hitchhike and this guy was walking his dogs and he was just going to his car and he said oh can I give you a ride to town and that, that'd be amazing thank you and then we were just chatting in the car and um, he, he was a, he was saying he, how he was a, a musician, he was a pianist and travelled the world um, and just, it was just a lovely gentleman. And then as he was dropping me off, um, he was like, have you got somewhere to stay? And I said, no, I'm actually going to get back on trail. But it was, it was by this time, it's, it's getting dark quite early. So I need an hour of daylight. And he said, oh, are you sure? It's quite cold. My wife and I would be delighted to have you. We're taking our neighbours out for Mexican food. You'll be welcome to join us. I was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. So he said, well, here's my number anyway, just in case. So I did my business in in town and then it was cold, it was dark. And I was like, Shona, this guy is a total gent. <laughs> he and his wife will be delightful company. Why are you not doing this? And I kind of had this thing that I told myself at some point on the trail as well. It's not just about the miles, it's about people. And I reminded myself of this. It's about people, not just the miles. So I called him. I said, oh, actually, could I stay? And he's like, of course, I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'll pick you up. <laughs> And just had such a beautiful evening with him and his wife. We went out for this Mexican with um, his neighbours and um, he had this big piano in his lounge. And once we got back from the dinner, he's like, right, what can I play for you? What music? What's your favourite classical song? And he played Claire de Lune for me and his wife made jewellery and she gave me this beautiful pair of earrings that she'd made. And again, I kept it like, like Sally and her husband. I feel like I actually, although it was only a kind of brief friendship, I feel like I've made friends friends with people that I will stay in touch with and again this is a couple that do like to travel so they've said they'll like to come to Scotland to to meet me but again that for me it was just brought home how easy it is for me to get 
like focused on making miles and of meeting goals. And actually, it's it's people that you will remember over vistas and what, how many miles you did in a day. So yeah, there 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 are many stories like that, but there are two that really are are wedged in my brain. I love that, and I hope they come and visit you. Um, visit I you do in Scotland. Too. <laughs> I do. So you know, it's been it's been a couple of weeks now since you're back, and um, I'd, I'd love for you to know, like reflecting back, back, is there is there anything that you would have done differently, knowing what you know now, having gone through that experience? Would you have changed any of the planning? Would you have done your resupply? Is there any kit or gear or anything that you wish you'd had, or anything that you would change out? Yeah, in terms of the the kit, the gear, I was really happy with everything. Actually, I don't think I would change anything with my my gear. Uh, I was a little bit cold, like I was saying, for a few days in the Sierra, but for the amount of time it was and the um, the weight <laughs> the weight penalty, the only thing maybe I would have I bought some rab mittens after the Sierra, and I was I still I still use them loads after. So I wish I had better gloves. Actually, that might have been the one thing I'd have changed. In terms of the other thing I would change would be I got severe iron deficiency anemia because I wasn't eating enough iron. And I think even if I wasn't a vegetarian, I just really struggled with eating. In Northern California, it just the heat uh, and just something going with maybe just disgusted at eating the same things all the time I don't really know but I just couldn't eat for a while so I think even if I wasn't vegetarian I'd have got it so I now um if I'm doing another long distance hike I will always take iron supplements that's been a big a big learning for me otherwise I don't think there's anything I'd have changed maybe just if I get sick I would seek health care quicker uh, I would trust that I have travel insurance and that will cover uh, getting getting care uh, and, and maybe just what I'd said there about seeking uh, accepting hospitality and accepting offers of help I think I did do that pretty well but I would be really clear of that if I'm doing another hike if anyone says do you want to come stay in my house if they don't seem crazy yes <laughs> but I think I generally did when people did offer me kindness I generally did but that just that kind of mantra of people over miles kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah. can I ask you about your shoes because I think you bought you bought four Ooh. pairs four pairs of trainers that is another thing I would do differently. So you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the shoes. The shoes, yeah. So I, I got a really good deal from an amazing shop in Inverness, um, on the shoes that everyone seemed to be wearing on the trail. Uh, Ultras. Um, I've forgotten the name. Do you remember the name of the make? Uh, any but I, be, I remember the shop because I've been in the shop with you so I know oh, how yeah, amazing they are yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if people google ultras uh, anyway they'll get the shoe uh, but anyway yeah so it's a zero drop shoe and I wore it for three months so I wasn't like an idiot just getting these shoes and not trying them out I wore them for three months uh, in, in in Scotland and did trail running with them and things like that and had and loved them they had no problems no issues at all but yeah throughout Washington I had severe foot problems problems pretty much from the start <laughs> or bad not severe but, but reasonably bad foot problems I plantar fasciitis I had before begun to get that again um just did not feel happy in my feet at all was mixing up insoles trying everything and then um in Ashland in Oregon, uh, I just gave up on the shoes and tried uh, Socrates. So, am I saying that right? Socrates, 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 I think they are. French make of shoes, which are not a zero drop, a much more supportive shoe. And I only needed two of them to last me the whole trail, uh, the rest of the whole trail. And I've, one pair are still in good nick. <laughs> so they, they were the right shoe for me. And when I was sort of getting advice in shoe shops after I decided the ultras didn't work. It was just some people were just saying like with heavy loading. Although I had a couple of times gone out in the Scottish Hills with the ultras with my pack. It hadn't been enough, I suppose, to give them a shot and the pack maybe hadn't been heavy enough. So that was a big bit of learning. Don't don't <laughs> stock up your shoes before you go. Like, yeah, just see what's working for you on trail and then buy your shoes on trail. And actually that's also reminded me of another thing I would change up. I read all of these blogs saying don't send too much food ahead of yourself. Like in Washington you kind of had to because the we supply was more difficult, but Oregon there were more options. But I would send boxes to myself with the same porridge and the same fish, tuna fish things that I'd bought and lots of 
cliff bars that I just eventually just could not face and trail mix that I could not face. So I was just giving away my food to everybody. Everyone thought I was great, but <laughs> I um, had to still buy the, some of the food or just stop eating a lot of food. Um, so I would be, yeah, not, not be buying as much food in advance. I would change that. Yeah. I mean, I'd, actually, that's sort of a, quite a nice segue. So Alison Trigel um, says, congr- from awesome member of the Tough Girls Tribe, says, you know, congratulations to Shona, looking forward to the podcast. She'd love to know more about the funding. How much cash would you need for an adventure like this? And how did you raise raise the funds you know so what were you working with a specific budget did you have like an emergency fund that you could dip into did you stick to your budget do you know how much how much you spent Uh, so one of the things i one of my projects to do i want to go through and work all of that out i haven't done that yet so what i did was um i I've, i've got a savings account so i had some savings that basically funded the trip um but I I Airbnb'd my house while I was away. So I'm lucky I own my own home. And I had people in that and my friend managed that for me and I, I paid her for that. But that hopefully was most of my spending money. Again, I still have to do those calculations. And once I've done that, if you want to, I, I'm going to put it in a blog anyway so I can share that with you to, to share on the Tough Girl um, group. Uh, but yeah, so, so it basically it was funded by my savings and by your being being my house while I was away and um, I think I probably lived on about five thousand pounds while I was away but like I say I have to check that and the other thing uh, was kits wise some friends helped me who worked within the industry to get some quite good discounts on kits and the th- final component was I never asked anybody for money at all um the money that the, I was fundraising, but uh, while I was there, so that was the only ask I had, if, and it was a very soft, non-pushy ask. But while I was on trail and before I went, a couple of friends said, "Like I really want to help you. Is there something I can buy for you?" So somebody bought me my leggings, which were amazing. They've they've lasted me all of this time, and somebody bought my emergency beacon. I didn't have one of the ones on contract. I just had one that you, it's, it's a, if you, if you press it, someone comes to get you. That's it. <laughs> so I couldn't SMS or anything. So I had, had that. And somebody bought my battery charger thing. And then when I was on trail, um, a f- people, a couple of people got in touch and said, I want to pay for a hotel room oh. when I was having a hard time. So three people actually got in touch and paid for, for a t- hotel rooms or tiny house Airbnb while I was uh, out there, which was amazing. Um, and I just decided, actually, if, if people want to help, it's OK to say, yes, thank you. That's really kind. And it's not easy sometimes, is it, when you're very independent and, you know, people, it's their hard earned cash that they're they're giving to you. But I thought, well, they've offered and it really helped me. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that that does that answer the question on the funding? Oh, story? yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And because yeah. I think I've heard it's around like about a thousand dollars per month. So that would actually work out too, because you were yeah. out there for about like yeah. you know, five months or so. So exactly. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It is but I do want to yeah. crunch those numbers. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do that. So I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to write a blog and share that. So definitely that will be yeah more specific and you talked about your soft your soft asking as well because you were actually raising money um for a charity which is you know super incredible would you like just to to share a little bit about how much you raised and the charity and and how that went yeah absolutely so um in my my home city of Inverness there is a charity called Mikey's Line and it's a mental health emergency um, initially it was it was a, a emergency text line and more recently they've also opened up an emergency sort of dro- drop in center for people with um, sort of a mental health crisis um so yeah that's called Mikey's Line named after after a young man called Mikey who took his own life and any life taken is is too much so it's just a really important cause and um yeah so all I didn't on my business I kind of got my Instagram it's kind of both personal and and business and my Facebook I've got a Facebook page that's personal and business so on those I didn't really ask at all for funds it was just on my personal Facebook page I was sharing less of my my story but I was sometimes just posting some pictures there and sharing a little bit and there I just updated on people and how much we raised and thanked people and asked if anyone wanted to give so mostly just through that and um, yeah, as of today £6,000 we've raised my target was 4000 and I thought that was going to be difficult so I'm just 
absolutely blown away by people's kindness. That kind of feels like the theme song for my trek, really, is over overwhelmed by people's kindness. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely amazing. What I'll do is I'll make sure that I put the links um, to the charity, to your Facebook page, to your Instagram page, to your oh, website, you. to your blogs. So people can people can follow along. Um, thank you so much, Zaylan. You're welcome. She had she had a she had a few different um, few different questions. Um, oh, sorry, it's Zay from the Tough Girl Tribe. A few different questions, but mm-hmm. we, we've discussed quite a few of them. But one mm-hmm. of them is um, when's the book coming out? Will you be writing That's- a book? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> is, the good, is the honest answer to both questions um, and it's interesting on trail like I was doing this daily diary and I loved I loved keeping that diary and I loved just how people were so kind in their responses to it and initially people were saying oh yeah when's your book coming out I want to read it and I was like oh ha 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 yeah 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 and then um, at some point I've kind of thought oh maybe I could write a book <laughs> so I'm not saying I am going to write a book and part of me was like, well, I'd like to wait till I'm a better writer. Let's wait for a few years and write more. Because I do love writing, but I feel like my vocabulary isn't as good as it could be and all of those things. But, um, yeah, just more recently, I was thinking, well, I guess I've kind of got a lot of content already written. Uh, and a friend of mine has had a book published recently about, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's about um, breast cancer and her mum dying and being in the Monroes and all of that. So I'm going to meet her for a coffee just to find out more about her story of getting published. So I'm, I've got... I'm, I'm open to the idea if, if, it, if it could work. Um, but I kind of just believe um, seeing where your energy is, pushing some doors and seeing if it's the right time and if things will move my way or if it feels like ah, the doors are all pretty tough right now. It's not quite the right season. But either way, I'm going to keep writing because I absolutely love writing and just sort of see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's another long distance trail in you? There could be. <laughs> I, get, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, really don't know. Like at, at times, it's not been that long since I finished, but I guess I've had enough time to think, to begin to think things. And at times I've been like, oh, wow, like the continental divide seems really exciting, maybe a little bit harder, uh, but like kind of doable and almost like I've I've got more of a sense of what that would involve. So why don't I just whack one out quite soon? <laughs> and then another part of me is... I feel like my my appreciation of time has changed a bit from being on the trail in that I've, I've got better, but I definitely used to live life in a hurry, kind of got to do all the things all the time and hurry up and get it done because you don't have much time left on the planet kind of thing, or you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in terms of your health. But I also feel like I've been away for five months and in some and on the trail that felt like quite a long time. But come, since coming back, it feels like, I've been away for a few weeks <laughs> so I just feel like time isn't doesn't have to be this rushy thing and I don't have to know yet if if it's the I don't know yet if it's the right thing to do another trail next year or in the next five years or, or whatever I, but I feel like I have the tools in terms of being clear on my values and being somebody that works on her own limiting thoughts to that I'll know when I know if that makes any sense so I'm being a bit coy I'm there Sarah but the genuine answer is I don't know I'm not hiding something here uh, I feel open to it and I absolutely loved the PCT and at times I absolutely hated it <laughs> I thought why the hell am I doing this you know it's 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 never one thing or the other is it it's um yeah and I'm, I'm happy to just continue to share that process and I am right now to continuing my online diary um not as regularly because it's maybe less interesting for people <laughs> but sharing what it's like to have completed the trail and to be living with this transition and to be living with the uncertainty of not quite knowing what, what, what's going to come up from from that adventure do you feel as though it's been life-changing for you yeah yeah i do yeah yeah i, I, I yeah I, I mean i suppose it's, a, it's quite a what 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 is it? I suppose you could argue that any significant encounter is life changing, and I and I, I think lots of conversations I had on the trail were life changing, and um, yeah, like I did. I think I just think lots of things are life changing all the time. Um, but yeah, that's definitely been a life one of those things in my life. Yeah. yeah. I mean- because one of the things that a lot of people talk about is like the the adventure blues you know this this, mm-hmm. this you know this is something that you've dreamed about you've you've spent a huge amount of time like planning and then you've gone out there and you've 
you've achieved this pheno- phenomenal achievement. You know, not many people go out and, 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 you know, spend that length of time out there in the woods, walking on the Pacific Crest Trail, you know, accomplishing a, a massive, massive physical and mental challenge. And then you are now back, you know, back in Inverness and probably, you know, back in your own bed and nice and warm <laughs> and, and getting back into getting back into work and, and doing your coaching. And um, have you ha- had any adventure blues yet? Or do you, do you think it's hit yet or not right yet hit? It's not yet hit. No, I, I don't think it has. Cause, so after finishing the trail, I then had a bit of time traveling with friends I'd met on the trail and spending Thanksgiving with them in Texas. And then I used to live in London. So I then spent nearly a week in London seeing friends. And that was really fun. So it's just it's felt like the holidays continued. And I only came home last Tuesday night. Um, so it's not it's not even a week yet since I've been back in the islands. And then it's been really lovely just catching up with people. And I actually had a, a bothy adventure at the weekend for my friend's birthday. And we did bike biking and some mountaineering and staying in a freezing bothy. So there's just been like a ton going on. Um, so I just, yeah, I think I think you're right. You hit the nail on the head that it hasn't sunk in yet. But By the way, I'm, I'm so, hoping it won't sink in because I'd love you to get, <laughs> get through without having like any adventure blues. But... Oh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. Sorry, I cut you off. I don't know. Also, I thought, yes, yeah, um, there was a really interesting article that I shared somewhere recently. I think I should have shared it in the context of a post that I wrote about maybe like a, a shadow that I'd felt one morning since when the first morning I woke up in my own bed. I just came to like a shadow kind of thing. And, and there's a research article that's just come out. And it's like when I'm saying research, I think the lady would say it's a very small scale research. It was a sample size of 20 people who hiked the PCT. I think I'm getting this right. I haven't got it in front of me. So um, forget, I don't even remember the author's name, but I can again send you the link to it. But she interviewed a, a small number of people who'd finished the PCT this year on the question of adventure blues. And her kind of thesis uh, what, from, from those interviews was it's what people grieve isn't just the trail it's actually their identity their sort of concept of self or their identity in relation to the trail the sort of self that they've discovered and I thought that's such an interesting thing and especially I suppose especially if you feel you're a very different person on the trail and then you're kind of going back to a more a life where you're maybe feeling like you're more constrained by the social norms and you're not maybe as able to be that self that you met on the trail and I feel like I'm maybe quite lucky that maybe I'm a wee bit older and that I've done a lot of work through counselling and life coaching that I I don't feel, if I use the term my Sharona for my trail self and Shona for my own self, I don't feel like Shona and my Sharona were different people. Um, but maybe my Sharona was a wee bit more courageous and adventurous. So um, I'm hoping that I will carry those into my new normal but I'm also hoping that the adventure blues won't hit quite so much because I don't feel there's a big gap between between those two people and I'm so lucky like my life is really interesting even if I don't go on another big hike next year I will be in the Scottish mountains a lot and I do work that's hugely varied and work that I love and um, yeah there's lots of quite exciting things in my life anyway um, but all of that pride comes of horror fall. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not in any way um, saying that it won't be difficult and all of that as well. Shana, what advice would you have for other women who are thinking, you know, I want to do something like you. I want to be more courageous. I want to grab that courage and just do something epic. What advice would you have for those women? You know, what if, what have you learned from from this experience? Yeah, I guess it's then it's getting really clear. What is it you want to do? Why do you want to do that? Um, yeah, yeah, so, so you can really, when it's difficult, if like say your planning process is difficult or you begin to doubt yourself, if you're really clear about what you want to do and why, that kind of becomes an anchor for you that you can come back to when the, the storms, because I think sometimes the hardest bit is getting there, isn't it? Sometimes the, the actual doing it isn't that bad, is it? It's, it's all the things that come in our way, that the, be that self-doubt, be that raising the money, um, be that work constraints, whatever. So getting really clear on your anchor as to why you're doing it 
and then we're going through the logistics and all of that. Uh, and then the, I think the biggest thing that will often stop us is our own internal dialogues rather than external circumstances. Um, so our thoughts, the stories we're telling ourselves. So to notice how quickly, maybe the example that I gave about the book, when, when, when people said at first when I was when I was sharing my journal, people were saying, well, you can write your book. I was like, no, 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 um, I, I wouldn't, couldn't do that. That was, I think my no now was actually fear um, and my own stories about I'm not good enough writer and those sort of things. So I think when people often were planning a, a big adventure um, it, or, or fear or I, I'm not outdoorsy enough or I'm whatever our, our story is, I'm not enough in some variant comes along and um, we can realise that's just a thought. It doesn't have to. I can tell another story. So really catching yourself in your own storytelling and realising when it's not actually true, it's just an opinion and that you could have another opinion. And then going back to that anchor of this is why I want to do it. Um, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And then, yeah, lots of other things I suppose I could say, but listening, people have got gleaned lots of other wisdom from uh, listening to your podcast and following other inspiring women like there's just no end on tough girl podcast of inspiring women doing much more gnarly things than I've done um just yeah and I think surrounding yourself if you haven't got people in your life that are inspiring you and doing things that are maybe more scary than you've done already just listen to them on podcasts they don't have to be your friends that you can just if you're surrounded by naysayers or or uh, people who are very similar to you yeah listening to a bunch of podcasts reading books being inspired on a daily basis um, and then that will help you change your story if you if you've maybe got a bit of a negative story quite a lot of words there I hope I didn't say too much <laughs> no I love it I love hearing you speak I love how I love how you you shared your journey and Shana, I'd love for you to also just share how people can connect with you find out more about your PCT find out more about working with you find out um yeah more about connecting yeah, so uh, I have a website where my blog lives. So basically my Instagram uh, walk, is Walk Wild Coach. And that's like my daily diary off the trail and life beyond. <laughs> and the content on that is also on my blog. So you can read that as a more condensed, like like seven diary entries together, rather than going through each Insta post. So it depends how you like to consume. And then also my Shona Mc person coaching is my Facebook page but the three of them are very similar content but the actual website is the one where it tells you more about the actual offers that I'm running I would um, so in terms of the I've got a retreat coming up in May I and if you live in the in Venice which is maybe a small sample of your podcast I'm doing a goals with heart workshop in January and then um, I have a work with a mountain guide in May and June running tracks for well-being so yeah website Shona McPherson coaching is the Facebook and then what wild coaches Instagram I wish they all had the same name but sorry they don't <laughs> <laughs> that's okay they don't have to have the same name oh but Shona a massive thank you for coming back on the tough girl podcast extra to share more about your in- incredible challenge I'll, I'll make sure I put all the links to everything that you've talked about and also the link to our first podcast where people can find out more about sort of your, your early life and the planning and preparation that went in and, and what your thoughts were like before heading off on the challenge so I think it's a it's a really complimentary episode to listen to as as well as this episode but thank you so much for sharing I really do appreciate it you've been an incredible inspiration and I've really really thoroughly honestly thoroughly enjoyed reading your Instagram posts and and reading the words that you've written I know so many other people as well so, so thank you so much oh my pleasure thank you it's been lovely to speak how are you doing I hope you are well so massive thank you to Shona for coming back on the Tough Girl Podcast Extra to share more about her journey on the Pacific Crest Trail what an adventure what a challenge I know for me it is definitely on my bucket list and something that I would love to do at some point point if you haven't listened to the first episode with Shona please do go go back and take a listen to that all of the links and everything that we've talked about is available at toughgirlchallenges.com if you go to the website that's almost like like the central hub which is where you can find more information out about our previous guests that we've had on and also future guests let me just give you an um a little heads up about one of our future guests who's coming on the 31st of December we're going to be catching up with Yolanda Holder who is a professional ultra marathon walker in 2019 at the six days in the dome in Milwaukee she set a world and American age group record which was 413 miles 
um, and that was in the age category 60 to 64. In 2019, Yolanda also became the first African-American woman and second African-American to earn a U.S. race walk centurion and the oldest person at 61 years young to race walk 100 miles in under 24 hours. That's a really, really fascinating episode to listen to. And that's coming out on the 31st of December at 7 a.m. UK time. I'm going to be doing a final reflections episode and that'll be coming out on Thursday, the 2nd of January. That's going to be focused on the final six months of 2019. I'm going to be talking about the Camino, the Lycian Way. I'm going to be giving updates and plans for 2020 for Tough Girl Challenges um, and myself as well. You may have been, you may have recently been watching my Instagram stories that I did the Boxing Day dip, which was absolutely freezing. My poor little to- toes took ages to get their circulation back, but there is going to be a short vlog coming out. So there are new vlogs going to be coming out, especially on the Lycian Way. That's going to be coming out at the beginning of the year. So make sure you go and check out Tough Girl Challenges YouTube channel as well. I always think the days in between sort of Christmas and New Year are quite sort of strange. It's almost like you're in limbo. You finish this, you know, big Christmassy celebration and then you're almost waiting for the new year to start so there's going to be if you're a member of Tough Girl Tribe there's going to be a couple of things happening in that limbo time period there's going to be opportunity for you to reflect on your 2019 what went well what were you happy about what you pleased about what lessons have you learned from this year and be able to share that with the other members of the Tough Girl Tribe we're going to be looking I'm also going to be looking for words, two words from you about how you're going to describe your 2020. Obviously, they're going to be positive and personal to you. There's going to be a big welcome to new members of the Tough Girl Tribe, the newest uh, patrons and supporters who are joining us to help start 2020 in a way. We're also going to be doing some work on goals for 2020. There's going to be information on making your goals smart, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. And there's also going to be an opportunity for members of the Tough Girl Tribe to ask me questions about the Tough Girl podcast, the Tough Girl vlog the Tough Girl Tribe, Tough Girl Challenges, basically anything you want me to talk about in the final Reflections episode, which will be coming out on the 2nd of January. Now, I do love talking, obviously, but I'm going to try and keep it to, keep it to a minimum. But I just want to say a massive thank you for all your um, all your uh, love and support over the past uh, 12 months. It's been absolutely incredible. There has been a lot going on behind the scenes, which I cannot wait to, to wait to share with you. So they'll be coming out in the final Reflections episode. But massive thank you to all the patrons. If you want to support the Tough Girl podcast, then please do go check out Tough Girl. No, go not Tough Girl Challenges. We well, check that out anyway. But please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And you can sign up and support the work I'm doing to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.